Hello, and welcome to Education Chat, a podcast created by students for students. I'm your co-host, Alyssa Ray. And hi, I'm Alicia Paulino. And today we are joined by Kevon Lee. He is an author, activist, motivational speaker, and much more. Hi, Kevon, and welcome to Education Chat. It's great to be here. So can you start by telling us a little bit about your upbringing and background? So I was born in San Bernardino, California. And then around the age of five, I'm not going to get in too deep, just a little summary. Around the age of five, I entered the foster care system. And so I was in that system until I was nine. That's when my grandmother, she moved from Mississippi to down here to um, basically just adopt me. And then once she, the adoption was final when I was nine, we moved back to Mississippi. And that's where I was raised until my sophomore year of high school. Then I came back. When I got back out here, I took you know advantage of that, and then I went into, I went into college, and that's where I discovered what I want to do in life. Uh, advocate. I wanted to be an activist. I wanted to speak on a national level, so I'm getting opportunities to do that. Uh, another opportunity that came was right after, no, right before I graduated was authoring a book. So I got that out. Now I'm in the master's program right now, at Cal Baptist for Higher Education Leadership and Student Development, and I'm just. You know, I'm just working hard. <laughs> For many people, it's hard to really sit down and imagine what it's like to be in the foster system and what all of that entails. So can you mm-hmm. describe what it's actually like to be in foster care? I mean, I was a young kid. I was five years old. And so you having that question of where's my mom? Where's my dad? I'm not living with them. You're five years old. You see what's happening, but it's not registering in your brain because, you know, you're too young to actually know what's going on. I feel as if my experience wasn't as bad as a lot of people that I hear. But one thing I would say is it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's lonely. It could get lonely because you miss your family, you miss your parents. And a lot of kids who actually go into foster system, they, they grow resentment towards their family because it's like, what did you do for me to be in this system? In my case, my mother and father were on drugs. That's a whole nother story. I ended up getting shot at the age of five. And so that's what put me in the foster care system. The woman who was my foster mother, she she was a good woman. She was definitely a good woman. She made sure I had everything I needed. She made sure I ate. She made sure I had clothes on my back. We lived in a better part of San Bernardino. I had my own room. So that part was good. But, and then my grandmother had me for like the last year until she adopted me. Hearing you talk, there's a lot of layers to the foster care system. So for those who are not familiar with the system, there's this term called aging out. Can you describe the meaning of it and how this process can be detrimental for foster youth? Aging out happens when you're typically, when you're so when you're 18, that's when you're considered like an adult. But people age out of the foster care system at 21. And it is detrimental because a lot of foster youth, like I said, don't have families. So once you age out, where are you gonna go? Who are you gonna depend on? It's either, all right, I work hard, I get what I could get, or I end up being homeless. And that's what happens to a lot of foster youth. They end up being homeless, unemployed, um, and car- incarcerated, or even sometimes dead because they don't have those resources. They don't have them basic life skills. And then what comes with that is trauma. Kind of touching on what you said a little bit earlier, um, what are some ways that bouncing from home to home can affect someone's schooling, their overall well-being, their mental health? Like, how does that affect someone, a, a child in particular, that is going in school right now? So when I went from, I was in third grade. I went to third grade out here, so I was nine years old. But since I got adopted, I had to move, and I didn't finish the school year. So the next following year, I went to the fourth grade, but they took me out of the fourth grade and put me back in third so I had to fail a grade because of that. And it wasn't because I had bad grades. I just didn't take a test. And then when I asked, could I take the test? They said, no, you can't take the test. And so that's what a lot of our youth, if they move state to state, or even if they move city to city, because it's important to build those friendships, those relationships. And you got to think, if you're moving from school to school, every school might have, okay, you have to learn this in the year. But still, if you're moving, you might be on a different part. You might be behind. You might, and it takes some time, it takes a while, especially for foster youth, because you need all types of documents to enroll them. And so they can miss like five months of school. And I've heard of some kids that did, I heard some foster youth who had over 30 placements. I think this one person I know has 74 placements. 
So you can only imagine how they was considered, you know, they, they, they said this to me, people considered dumb. No, you're not dumb. You just didn't have the opportunities of learning like a regular child or a normal child who have a family at home that you could stay in this school district and you could just stay there until your years are up and then you go to another school. It's super de detrimental. And that's why only 50% of foster youth graduate. 3% actually get a um, higher education, a bachelor's. Less than 1% get anything higher than a ma uh, bachelor's. The system is so broken. So can you describe the importance of having a support system, having those relationships and having good people around you as a foster youth? I, I wanna stress that it is very important to have a mentor. I was honestly blessed because I was able to live with my grandmother. And although nobody in my family went to college, my mom and dad didn't even graduate from high school. I knew at about my sophomore year in high school, okay, Kevin, you're about to graduate. What are you going to do after graduation? And I realized like, man, I need to go to college because in my head, I'm like, I can't, what am I going to do? I, I have to move out. I didn't want to be like my mom and dad. I didn't want to depend on adult while I was an adult. I had to take that into consideration. So when I went to college, that's when I built a lot of relationships where I joined CYC, California Youth Connection, which is organization in California that um, tr that basically goes to Sacramento once a year, foster bills, and change it for the foster care system. I had relationships in that. I joined EOP, RSP, the Renaissance Scholar Program at Cal State San Bernardino, where I had, if I needed help with groceries, they helped me. If I needed help with rent, they helped me. Anything I needed help with, they made sure I had it. On top of that, I just had people around me that wanted to help and guide me. And once I got myself in that position to get these opportunities, I just took took on to it. I just took hold of it. And but the thing about that is that a lot of foster youth are told, and I was told this too, you can't be nothing. Or I was literally told by my sophomore teacher that I, I rose my hand. She said, who wanted to go to college? I rose my hand. She said, you college, please. Those exact words. She said, you college, please. And I, I'm telling you, I was angry. I start throwing my glasses. A lot of foster youth get told that, that you are not, there's you nothing you can do. You're gonna be like a mother and father. You're not going to college. And when you get told that constantly or nobody tells you that you can do it, then what do you do with that? You start to believe it, right? You start to believe that, okay, that's what I am. And the way you treat people, that could dictate their future. And it is important, I'm telling you, it's very important to just be nice in general to everybody. But foster youth need that extra care so they can be successful. Something you said earlier was that, you know, you said that the system is broken. I think a lot of people can agree with that statement. How can the system improve to make sure that, that they can support um, foster youth better? Honestly, I think it comes down to politics, so it's hard. But the people who are in those positions, they, they, they are stubborn. Because when I went to Sacramento to speak to legislators or I spoke to assembly members, secretaries, all that, most of them were like, oh, wow, we have to, you know, sign this bill if it comes to my office. We have to do that. And some of them are like, OK, so why, why were your parents on drugs? OK, who fault is that? And it's just ignorant to that because they didn't grow up around that. They didn't grow up around seeing poverty all the time. For instance. Where I work at, I work for San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools for homeless and foster uh, education. We hired mentors and I'm one of them. So I actually go to the school campuses and I mentor students. We hire them to mentor our foster and homeless population because we know that 50% of them are going to graduate from high school. We know that because that's what statistics say. Just having that foundation of, okay, we, we see the problem. They need somebody in their life because when they go home, they go back to their lives, their situation. When they come to school, it's like a safe place. So we go on campus and literally beating into their heads that you can go to college. You can be successful all the time. And I think that's what we need. I, I wish that 
they will allocate money just for mentoring programs. Because you talked about the system as a whole and the politics of that, but talking with the education, because you said that 50% don't graduate because of statistics, but statistics can always change. So where are some ways that the educational system as a whole can help to support the needs of foster care? Like, like I said, we need to allocate money towards that because they know who are foster homeless. They know. They, they have that in their system. They know who exactly is their foster population they need to do something with them. If that's after school programs, if that's in, at lunch, have somebody come talk to them, have somebody come mentor them, reach out to those students, let them know that they're, they aren't alone, that their situation doesn't have to be their end. And I think that will be very important because everybody just need that one caring adult. So I told you about how that teacher said, you college please. And she was a terror, she was a tyrant. And I had another teacher that said, not only can you go to college, but you must go to college. Like, there's no other option. There's no other option, Kevin. You are going to college. And I remember my senior year, she made me call every college I applied to and ask them, when are you guys going to accept me? Okay, you guys haven't looked at my application. I'll be, I'll call back tomorrow, <laughs> literally. But it's people like that. She didn't give up on me. And to this day, I talked to her. We know that only 3% of foster youth ever earn a college degree like you mentioned um so first of all congratulations because you were in that three percent so very Thank proud you. of you i'm happy that you were able to do that and that you were able to prove everybody wrong who ever doubted you but we wanted to ask you why do you think that is i know you kind of touched on it a little bit throughout this entire interview why do you think that is and can you describe your experience navigating um higher education as a first generation student like how was that for you and what was your experience like it started in high school i didn't know that colleges had programs like this and i think cal state if you ask me has one of the best programs in the nation um, when it comes to helping foster you because they they simply do i talked to other foster youth in other schools they be like yeah they don't even contact me we're here they reach out all the time it's like man you're a pest that's how it is but that's the good part. Specifically, when I was in higher, when I was in my undergrad, I'm not gonna lie, it, I had the mindset of I'm getting through this no matter what. They made they they made it easy for me. They made sure. For first, I had priority. Foster youth first group on campus to pick classes, so I never had a struggle like, oh, am I gonna get this class? Second, they made sure that um, I had a place to live. Didn't have to worry about that. If I needed food, they would do whatever they take they it took to give me food if i needed books i never paid for a book in my undergrad masters whole different story they made it easy they made the path so easy but every program doesn't have that so what is one misconception about people who are in foster care and we know that there is plenty out there but what is one in particular that you want to share with us that they're bad kids they get deemed as people who are very disrespectful people who don't obey and that's not the truth. And they get say that they're bad. No, they're not bad. They're hurt. They're sad. They're they're angry. You hear me? I've seen so many foster youth. I've seen so many homeless youth. And they have a lot of trauma. So we've been talking a lot about your upbringing and your past and everything. Mm -hmm. But now we want to know what's next for you in the future. My plan is to speak. My, my future, I, I just want to speak. I love speaking. I love motivating, motivating. I love just seeing the smiles on kids' faces. I love them looking at me as, oh, he did it. I could do it too. So those are my future plans. I'm definitely going to stay in the education arena um, because I feel like that's where I'm most needed because if I'm not mistaken, over 60,000 foster youth in our state something like that and so there's a need for that population i know i want to write a book so i wrote a children's book but i want to write a memoir so about my life i, I want to get an edd one day but we're going to take a break after this master's program because it is killing me so so far those are my future plans just to make a difference like my whole thing is making the difference that's like literally my my, my slogan make a difference sorry i just want to say nope. great <laughs> that i loved how I, you could literally see a spark in your eyes and you smiled when i asked you about your future so that's just beautiful to see i, I saw it right like I, he was, like, was your, just, I could yeah. see your eyes trying to like move i, yeah, I could see it beautiful. i just want to say you're such a natural speaker like i'm just i don't even know you but i'm so proud of you like i am really really proud of you and i'm in my undergrad program right now so i know how hard it is i can't even imagine a master's program so take a break 
You deserve it. Take <laughs> go go to Cancun or something. Take a break. Oh, well, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but it has honestly been such a pleasure talking to you. You are really, really genuine, and I can really see that. And I enjoyed hearing your story. I know Alyssa enjoyed hearing your story. And as we close out this episode. What would you like to say to any child in the system right now that is in need of guidance and motivation? I would tell them, and I got this quote from Inky Johnson. He said, impose your will on life because once you do that, life will give in. Like just impose your will, no matter what, just say, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop until I get it. And then once I get it, I'm going to reach for another goal. And once I get to that goal, it's another one. And that's how I literally think about my life. In 2020, when my grandmother passed away, I said, you know what? I need to be, make a change. I, I said, I'm going to be a motivational speaker. I'm going to be traveling to speak. I'm going to speak in front of thousands of people. I put myself out there. I imposed my will on it and I did it. So for anybody who's young, not even young, any person in general, Whatever you want to do, impose your will on it and it can happen.